I guess the, the uh, final question I have for you is what is the best way to relate to is there a way to relate to a Biden presidency that isn't either this sort of, I think, frankly, kind of magical sort of like, oh, well, you just got to keep going and push him to the left. Or on the other hand, just saying like, all right, whatever, you know, Comcast Joe, MBNA Joe is president. Is there a way of relating to him uh, and that presidency that is, you know, constructive while, while being really grounded in reality about the power dynamics? That's a great question um, and a very important one. I'm glad you're asking. I think it's exactly the question progressives need to be asking themselves. And I don't think there's an immediate answer too. We've got to be discussing it like we're doing here, thinking about how to do it. I start from the premise like you that getting rid of Trump is absolutely the single most important thing facing humanity uh, in November. And that, whoever was running against him, I feel that way. If it was Bernie, it'd be a whole different thing. But even by Trump, that would be the big to, good versus evil yeah, race right but there. But it, Trump has to go. There's nothing, no, no if, ands, or buts. That's the single most. Present. The second thing we have to do is get rid of um, uh, Mitch McConnell controlling the U.S. Senate. That's and they're very close to each other. And I know in both cases, what replaces that will not be what I would like. It will not be Bernie Sanders and Jeff Merkley and AOC sort of setting the policy. Uh, but I do know it will stop stuff that we will not be able to get back in the tube later uh, from happening. And that our very survival hangs on it, in my opinion. So, but I think we, we have, I don't think there's a, a simple way to approach it. I think it's gonna be a combination of both possibilities that you suggest is the, uh, I think we have to, for one thing, I don't think we should just say, hey, we can, let's get in bed with Joe and push his agenda. Um, I think we have to take it to him and push him as hard as we can on every possible issue. And, you know, I don't think you necessarily break with him in the sense of destroying his presidency, but I don't think you give him an easy pass. And I think you sometimes have to really call him out on a really important issue. I think it's imperative to demonstrate and bring people out to let this guy see that, look, you know, don't get big for your britches. We got you elected. We expect results and what you was doing in the past won't work. So, Am I hopeful that that will work with him? Well, I'm hopeful he'll be smart enough to see that he's got to adjust uh, to have a successful presidency. And what the system will allow him that, his bank rollers, his funders, his corporate donors who've been paying him for however long, uh, they're not gonna be happy with that because almost every important issue is go right up against that, his funders. Uh, and so it's gonna take a vision, courage, uh, political talent that I don't know if Joe Biden has, so I haven't seen it yet. We'll see. It was, Obama didn't have it, but Obama, right. what didn't, this is, you know, but at any rate, um, but I do think in the near term, uh, we are in an ironically, you know, Michael, I think in this great period where um, everything's lined up for a period of dramatically progressive social change in this country. We are the majority. We really are. I mean, you wouldn't know it watching MSNBC, where you think Claire McCaskill is leading the revolution, uh, or CNN or any of these other places. But we are the majority, and we're growing every day. And we've got really humane, sensible policies that will solve problems and give us a planet we can live on together and have good lives. Uh, and you know, they're popular where they've been done in other countries, and they'll be loved here. And the examples we've tried it in Social Security and Medicare. They were hugely successful. Public education, when it's funded well, hugely successful. Uh, so we'll stick with the fight. Uh, but, you know, it's really hard to predict right now. And because let's, uh, let's put it this way. Five years ago, if I said to you, 2015, January 2015, said, hey, what's going to happen in the next five years? If I told you, one of us said, well, this is what's probably going to happen. And so that you said, it's impossible. I don't believe that. You must be kidding. What a joke. That could never happen. Uh, one thing I like to think about the close is uh, I had a I'm I'm an optimist by nature and the reason for my optimism is that things do change and we can't ever predict them uh, and we can just sort of try to get a historical sense of where we're at and I think we're at a good point in some ways historically in terms of where people are at much more progressive country today than 30 years ago not even close I mean it's right. It's night and day difference. Now, if a majority of the people vote, progressives are going to win. It's just getting people out to vote is our struggle. Uh, that wasn't the case 30 years ago. 
Um, but you know, I had a professor in graduate school at the University of Washington in Seattle. He was from South Africa, a white South African. But he was anti-apartheid, that's why he came to America. And he, his family was all back in South Africa. And they were all working in the ANC with Mandela against apartheid. And I went into, but before I moved to Madison in 1988, I went into his office to say goodbye. And he was very sad. And I said, you know, what's wrong, Tony? Why, why, why are you, what's, what's the problem? Because he normally wasn't that sad. And he said, well, I've just been talking to my comrades in South Africa. And they say the situation is now hopeless. Uh, the ruling party will never give up apartheid. Mandela will never be released from prison. Uh, the, it, we all are convinced it's going to now come down to pure violence and it's going to be a bloodbath. And the country, whatever however it is up, will not be suitable to live in as so much death and destruction is going to take place. It's just, they're, they, they're irretractable. They refuse to negotiate under any circumstances if it means giving up uh, white supremacy and white control of society. That was in June of 1988. Wow. And I talked to friends of mine who were South African activists that later, they said that time, that's how they all thought. It was hopeless. Right. Never been worse. Two years later, Nelson Mandela is released from Robben Island Prison, where he'd been for 30 years. Uh, two or three years after that, he's elected in the landslide, the president of South Africa. In that intervening five years, there was less violence than you'd seen in a New Jersey bar fight on a Saturday night. I mean, there was, it was a completely nonviolent revolution that went from 1988 to 1990, 1993. Um, and no one saw that coming in 1988. The smartest people who devoted their lives to that issue were completely unprepared for that, right on the verge of its happening. So we, have, you know, we, we can never tie ourselves down by saying, well, it doesn't look that good now, man. <laughs> that just, it's, it's ridiculous. I think it looked good in South Africa. Look what happened there. Well, and even the violence that did emerge in that time, whether it was the kind of, there was the third force, uh, white nationalist violence, there was also some violence between ANC and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, IK, IK uh, in, uh, I'm forgetting, the Zulu nationalist party. But, you know, Mandela got a grip on those and the ANC. So, not, so even when those things did pop up, as you were saying, I mean, the, the power structure changed so quickly. And that is... I've read about that time and it is amazing to read because there's this enormous acceleration of violence going on from the security services and in rhetoric. And at the same, that's also the same time where, you know, like the head of intelligence, Neil Bernard is basically like, yeah, we are just, we're negotiating an end game here. Yeah. And the real question is what the settlement is and all of those negotiations are taking place. And, you know, people like, obviously like the professor couldn't have known. So yeah, and, and that's the, such a great way to leave it. For yeah. us for us today, that means going forward, this we may well be in May of 1988 for all we know. We won't know for a while, but you look at the sort of where things are, uh, the issues that are going on, the demonstration you see, the crises we're facing and the mindset of people and the culture. And it is highly combustible, very good things could happen. And similarly, some pretty bad things could happen. And that's exactly why Trump cannot be reelected in November. I agree. Well, Professor Robert McChesney, I really appreciate your time, Bob. Yep. Thanks a million. I hope you'll join us again. Really appreciate all your time and of course, all your work. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks. Be well. <laughs> you too. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks everybody.